recently entering the uh, Indian market and Upcar's helping us uh, achieve that goal and providing local assistance to any projects we do. So I'm aiming to talk about 50 minutes, uh, with plenty of time for questions afterwards. Um, I can see all your microphones are muted already, that's great. Uh, questions, please use the chat function, Upcar will monitor the chat and uh, uh, we'll answer those questions at the end, so it saves you forgetting the euro code, gives you some detailed information of how to calculate the capacity of the pin, uh, basically based on uh, uh, spanning across the uh, areas here. And again, this is very conservative. And also, generally, in our types of structures, you don't need to consider the pin as being replaceable. That's normally for a different type of structure, so you can do just ignore these bits and uh, else you'd be too conservative your pin design you'll find that um, if you try to analyze uh, many of the proprietary products out there you may find that these calculations don't work because they're very conservative and most people will use their own uh, analysis and type testing to justify interestingly that the irs does give you a bit more leeway for bending as it allows you to distribute the bearing on the span which gives you a far better design for the pin and that's very similar to what the old BS5400 used to do. So and we ourselves also use that kind of methodology in our pin design. So with those differences, it's, it's a bit to be quite careful how you're using maybe published data, because sometimes you don't know what factors are being assumed within that data, whether they're using um, partial factor of one or what type of air stress area they're using. Uh, it's the same in our, in our brochure. Obviously, we're a European company, so at the moment we have uh, calculations to Eurocode standards. Uh, it's something we're looking to change soon and then to help engineers in India publish different calculation methods, depending on what code they're working to. So typically, you, you just select the load based on what your design load is saying and it gives you back your diameter. But do be careful you are using or checking what partial factors have been using and what stress area has been used. So we also offer different, um, uh, lots of data for the uh, fork. This allows you to detail your structure very easily. You can download all CAD files uh, from you know, or Tecla and BOCAD and gives you all that main information you may need. So we move on to some of the main causes of failure uh, we see in tie rods. So some of the main aspects that we see really is can start from design stage. So really the, the in, uh, incorrect property uh, are used. Um, sometimes I think uh, Mr. Hegarty mentioned that uh, sometimes known as PT bar, sometimes these tie rods, uh, you have to be careful if you're using some kind of pre-stressing bar because often it will not have the ductility that's suitable for use on a, a tie rod disc structure. So be very careful, especially with the high strength bars, that they're always not, not always suitable because of their robustness and toughness on these structures. So generally stick to the, if you stick to the, um, the normalized steels around about the 500, 540, 460, you're gonna have a, quite a nice robust uh, ductile steel. If you go higher grade, I would suggest you stick to the 690 or below on that and just check its uh, ductility. Misalignment of connections is something we sometimes see, whether that's at design stage or poor fabrication. If your um, connection steel is, uh, plate is not in line with the force, then you put, uh, put in the, the tie rod under extra bending. If the poor installation, uh, quality control on site is very important. Uh, sometimes these uh, tie bars because the length have to be transported in separate lengths and connections made on site. So you do have to ensure that the engagement of thread is correct. All your fatigue, um, uh, I guess many of you guys there are experts in fatigue being mainly involved in bridges. So that's a very important consideration and often a cause for failure when it's not considered correctly. And then quality control, particularly of some of the components uh, like uh, clevises or cast forks. Uh, this can lead to some issues because the quality control may not be as tightly controlled as it is for the bar. So I'll go through some of these in more detail now. So we're looking at misalignment. 
uh, important when you're looking at uh, typically your welded connections that your line of force uh, actually goes through the weld detail. You don't want to be putting additional bending on the weld by having incorrect lines of force here. Uh, engagement of thread. So you should always check that there's a rule of thumb is one diameter at least engaged will generally give you a full strength connection. Um, again, for the misalignment, typic the, typically the uh, tie rod, we allow in our connection design a misalignment of half a degree, but anything more than that, then you'll be putting the plate into bending. Um, another issue we've seen in the past is uh, pins becoming loose, particularly on, uh, let's say, lighter structures prone to wind vibration, like the foot bridges, and you can often get these caps come off. Once the cap comes off, the pin can shake loose under the uh, reversal of load, and that can also be an issue. But looking a bit more at fatigue, now I must uh, say here I'm no expert on fatigue. I'm sure you guys know far more. To wise, but this is a, some of the pointers we do. We do know how to test to fatigue and give some pointers as to where to go. But really, it's very important um, uh, for these types of tie rods, particularly on bridges. So here's a, a typical failure uh, via fatigue. So classic um, initiation, then the crack propagation, and obviously we get rupture towards the end. But every project really must need to be considered in its own right. Uh, it's very hard for a manufacturer to say, I have tie rods that are fatigue resistant, because it depends on your structure and what your loads are, what your cycles are, what your stress range is. But often we do have test data from other projects where if there's similar kind of stress range and loads, then yes, we can give data as to what the fatigue resistance of the product is. So here we have access to uh, a fatigue test here. So we we make a mock-up and we just fatigue it generally to 2 million cycles. And we'll then do a tensile test after that to make sure it still reaches the proof load. Uh, by calculation, obviously there's the our SN curves and in the Euro code, uh, they give some detailed um, explanation of those. Uh, again, I'm no expert on the intricacies of these. I just know the basics of that. But basically, for a friendly connection in Eurocode, you're looking at a detailed category of 50. But if strictly speaking, if you went to EN 1993-111, the tension member code, they state a detailed category of 105. And if you're testing and your detailed category is 105, that's a very onerous test and uh, very hard to achieve on a threaded tie rod. So our experience is that most engineers will uh, not use this Part, and they would stick to just the 1993-19 in detail category of 50. But the Indian code also suggests its own SN curve. They have a detail category of 27 for threaded components. So again, it's just a, another area you should be looking into for the differences there. We have different types of connection types for hangers. Generally, as you, all the examples I've shown you are threaded connection because it's very flexible, can be made on site, can be adjusted in length. But we do also have options for forged dies and for welded spade connections. And if we're looking at threads, it's very important if you're specifying a threaded tie rod in a fatigue situation that you specify rolled threads. So a rolled thread has a much greater resistance than a cut thread. So as if you're aware, the two methods of making a, a thread is generally you can take a steel bar and you can either roll the material, you move material to form the thread, you don't make any cutting, or you cut material away to make the thread. So the two threads we have here, cut threads, you can see the grain of the material here this is the, the rolling grain of the, the steel bar. So here you can see the grain's been interrupted by the cut. Here on a rolled thread, you can see the grain's been moved. This has many advantages and gives it a much increased uh, fatigue resistance. You get a nice grain flow and increased strength around the root of the thread, which is where often fatigue will fail. But a word of warning, if you subsequently hot dip galvanize a rolled thread, you will severely reduce your fatigue resistance. So again, the process control is everything for prevented fatigue failure. We've done uh, quite some, uh, a lot of studies on thread manufacture and the improvement in fatigue. And what we found is that um, if you roll a thread, 
what happens is in the root here, you get a much stronger material, which aids the fatigue resistance. So we found really this is um, a roll thread before we've actually started loading and after rolling. So you can still see we've got high strength, whereas a cut thread has a very uh, low, much lower strength in that root. And we conducted also a number of tests where we took uh, cut threads and rolled threads and we just uh, cycled them up to 5 million cycles. What we found, as we expected, that a cut thread really only got up to about maybe 300, 500,000 cycles before it failed. A rolled thread, we, we couldn't make the bar fail when a rolled thread after 5 million cycles. But if we galvanized that rolled thread, then again, we achieve similar fatigue resistance as having a cut thread. So again, very important if you're galvanized, if you're specifying galvanized tie rods with rolled threads, ensure the galvanizing is done before the threads are rolled. Yep. Now your thread won't have any galvanizing protection, so you need to think of another means of how you're going to protect that thread, but do not hot dip galvanize a rolled thread. Another way of eliminating some uh, the bending at the connection plate is by use of a spherical pin. So we can provide a spherical seating inside the pin. This allows then up to say four degrees of um, rotation to occur without putting any bending into the system. Because what happens if you don't have that, often it's the bar, the weaker part in bending that suffers, and this is where the, the failure will occur. So this can also alleviate fatigue issues in tie rods. I mentioned before that we also have provided um, forged ends. This is a system common in Germany, uh, particularly for some of the infrastructure projects where they prefer to see a welded detail. This detail category is actually 140, so very onerous, but we can still make this and get fatigue resistance and exist in exceedance of uh, 2 million cycles. So here you can see we forge the ends of the bar, we, provide, we flatten out the area, allowing a nice uh, horizontal uh, full penetration weld to, to two sides. So this is much easier than a traditional system used in Germany where they had lots of down welding, maybe four welds either side of a tie bar. So now we only have nice horizontal welding and two sides. This also allows on-site uh, NDT to be performed a lot easier. So it's a, a system that may be of interest to you, but obviously uh, the downside is that you do have to have uh, good on-site welding control. And the other major downside really is there's no length control between here. So there's no length adjustment available. You have to be quite precise in your fabrication. Now let's look at one of the most important parts uh, we feel for the structural integrity of tie rods. And that's the quality control and particularly to do with the castings. Yeah. So many rolling mills can make steel bar uh, very accurately and very high quality. It's rare you get an issue with a rolled steel bar, issues are always within the connection. Yep. So how you take that load from the bar to the structure is key. And we say that most tension bars out there on the market, most proprietary systems will use castings. Castings is an excellent process, allows you to perform many shapes economically and at the right strength, but the quality control of that component is critical. Yep. Uh, we have to ensure that this end transfers the full load, else we don't have a structural um, uh, system that's uh, robust enough. So in the IRC, they give um, uh, many uh, castings you can use. I would guess really for um, structures, you probably use the IS2644. We don't know much information about that, I'm afraid. What we do know is EN10340. So in the Euro codes, they have a specific um, casting just for structural use, yep, just for use in uh, structures designed according to EC3. Now, a typical grade we will use is this G20 MN5. So typically, it gives us uh, a yield stress of about 300 and an ultimate 500 to 650. But more importantly, it has good elongation at 22% and very good charpy values. So it's a quench and tempered steel, but this is generally uh, 
one of the more practical steels to be using for this type of structure. So EN 10340 is quite a comprehensive document. It's very good. It tells you what materials you can select. It gives you weld repairs procedures, which is very important. Although you may think castings come out perfect, often there are defects in a casting that legitimately a foundry can repair by using welding. There's nothing wrong with that, provided you use the correct weld procedure. Uh, EN 10340 also talks about factory production control, again, which is a, a good requirement, and the mechanical testing of what you should expect and what conformance levels there are. However, a big um, flaw, we think, in this uh, code, it does not specify any NDT. The statement is said that this must be agreed between the foundry and the customer, and the customer in this case will be the product manufacturer. Now, as NDT, it can be relatively expensive. It's often one of the areas a manufacturer will look at to economize on the quality of his casting, or the cost of his casting, I should say, so that they have to make certain assumptions that the quality will be met by the minimum NDT. But really, you as a specifying engineer should really look at the NDT and look at it in each project consideration about what the risk of failure is and determine your own NDT requirements for castings, yeah. particularly if you're used to Euro code speak of execution class four type structures. Yeah. Just a good brief background to the casting process to explain some of the other issues that can happen. Uh, so the casting process, in this case, I'm talking about lost wax, which means how we make the mold out of a wax rather than uh, making a mold out of sand. So we have to, at the same time we make fork castings, also produce test bars. So this test bar here will give me four tensile samples. So first we make the mold, we cover the mold, uh, the, I mean the wax, sorry, then we cover the wax in uh, the mold material, we melt the wax out, we pour the steel in, and then we have our raw casting. Now, this stage is critical. From here, from a raw casting, it has to go to heat treatment, else you will not get the required properties. Uh, generally, at this stage, it may have the strength, but it will not have the ductility. So go into the, the ovens here, and from the ovens, they go into the quench pool. And this provides the quench and tempered properties. Now, what's important here is that this test bar is heat treated in these ovens at the same time as your casting, your product. Very important that occurs. Now for NDT non-destructive test methods, um, you've got several methods. You've got for cracks, you can use the MPI test. So we can test a product uh, for cracks. We can test it for internal defects using ultrasonic, or we could even x-ray. Now, all these can be done without destroying the casting. We don't want to destroy the casting, but it does not tell us what the mechanical properties of that casting are. And to do that, we have to do a destructive test. So we have to take our test bar, produce tensile samples, test them. That will then give us our material test cert. So the purpose of this slide really is to, is to highlight to you that when you see a test certificate for a casting, it doesn't represent necessarily a test on this product, it represents this product, the test bar. Yeah. So that's why going back to my earlier process, that it's very important that that test bar goes through exactly the same production process as the casting. So these are some of the potential problems that can happen with castings. Uh, we see sometimes that generally the results you get on the test certificate do not represent the products. They do represent the test bar, but not the products. So really, as engineers, you need to put systems in place that you can check uh, the batch traceability. There should be one test bar per melt for castings. Typically, for a casting, depending on the size, say an M100 casting, you would get six or seven castings for one melt. So therefore, per six or seven castings, you should have one test bar, one test bar result. Checking that the test bar has been heat treated at the same time. Has the product been well repaired? You would, on some structures, you would need to know that and make sure it's the correct procedure. If you're ever in doubt on a, on a project, really just, just order for a destructive test on an actual casting from the production batch. This will tell you whether you've met the requirements. 
X-ray is another good way of often looking for internal defects. It won't tell you any mechanical properties, but it will often uncover some issues you can't find by MPI or ultrasonic. In this particular example, you can see we have what they call shrinkage. So this is where the material, the casting hasn't cooled properly. Literally, the material is pulling away from each other, creating shrinkage cracks. And again, you have an inclusion here, a level four, all shown on X-ray. If we cut that uh, casting there, this is the type of defect you would see inside your casting. Quite expensive X-rays, but they do show some, uh, uh, they do highlight very visually any defects you may get. But I should uh, note here that not all defects are unacceptable. Uh, it's impossible really to get a casting and not expect some de uh, defects. There are some very good codes out there like the ASTMs and stuff and the Eurocode, which qualify what these defect levels are. And an experienced radiographer will be able to um, tell you what level the defects are. But typically anything to less than three or below is it an acceptable defect, an acceptable risk for a casting? So we're going to quickly look at um, an example of a, a failure uh, we've we've seen in the re in the past. Uh, I think it was two thousand and eight. So this is a bridge that was um, uh, constructed in the UK, and in about two thousand and eight, suddenly overnight, one of the tendons, uh, the tension members here, snapped. Uh, the bridge had no traffic on it. It was at night. Luckily, no one was injured. And so it was um, unusual as to why this, this happened. What was found in the end was that the casting actually met the yield properties. So they did some, as you can imagine, they cut some samples from the casting. They found it met yield properties. But the charpy and elongation, the ductility, failed to meet specification. It's almost though the casting had not been heat treated. Yet the foundry had issued test certificates to say the casting met mechanical properties because these were based on the test bars. Yeah? And there was no control over whether the castings went through the same process as the test bars. So really the conclusion of this uh, investigation uh, was that the test bar was not heat treat treated with the casting. So whilst it maintained the strength after uh, a few years of being loaded, it basically just failed uh, in a brittle fracture. But it does also demonstrate this project, the importance of redundancy. Because this uh, structure had been designed well, even though one tie bar failed, it did not lead to a catastrophic uh, collapse. But also it allowed replacement of all the tie rods. So as you can imagine, uh, none of the castings were trusted on this bridge. So every single tie rod was replaced. And that could happen because you could take one tie bar out at a time and just replace it with a new tie rod. Another failure we've, we've uh, uh, seen in the field is a stainless steel casting failure. This is a quite unusual where the uh, product was investigated and it was found to meet all properties, met full specification, absolutely nothing wrong with it, even down to the microstructure of the steel looks good. And so the only thing we could uh, 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 attribute this failure to was hydrogen embrittlement. So often uh, the supplier in this case had uh, polished a fork using an electrochemical process. He didn't achieve the desired result first time, so he put it through again. Again, it's a hydrogen-based process. This introduced more hydrogen, so it's thought that's what led to this brittle failure through the casting. So again, it's very important to, to realize that your post processing type things can often have a catastrophic failure uh, effect on some of these castings. Uh, in the UK, and I also believe in, in the US, there's the organization called CROSS. So this is a useful source of information for any kind of uh, failures that have occurred in structures. You may be aware of this. Uh, again, the, um, the cases I've talked about are all available uh, through CROSS. So you can refer to that. But also, there are alternatives to castings. Uh, we also supply forged uh, eyes. Again, this structure here may look like a cable stage structure, but actually it's using solid bar with forged eyes. Again, we can just forge a plate or forge a pin here. So the project I showed you earlier in, in Ireland uses forged eyes rather than castings. 
And it comes down to the last aspect of quality, and again, most important is the, the fabrication control. Uh, luckily, in um, Europe, we have EN 1090, which controls all steel fabrication and all aspects of fabrication, right down to what the hardness uh, profile of a hole should be, uh, what um, uh, dimension tolerances you're allowed. So it's a very good uh, document. I recommend you, you look at this, and there's no reason why you couldn't use it for any of your structures, even if you are designing to Indian codes. In the UK, in the Europe, we have to supply uh, items CE marked, and to get CE marked, we have to have a European technical assessment. Again, this involves independent uh, checkers and inspectors coming to our plant uh, at least once a year to test our product and make sure we follow the right um, approvals and uh, material testing. So it can be a very useful document if you're doing some complex structures. And there's also some model specifications which may help you out there uh, we have our uh, own one it's a generic one it may have azure at the top but it's a generic giving you the best practices you know and specifying tie rods but also if you want a, an independent and very comprehensive guide you can go to the uh, steel construction industry institute and they also have a model specification for the purchase of uh, tension assemblies which uh, again you can find useful uh, if you need those you can just contact uh, myself or Uka, and you can uh, assist with those. I'm going to finish off with just some uh, project examples. So here's a, a bridge in London, the overground. So it's like, obviously, it's part of the, uh, the, the London railway network. These bridges are uh, M90 tendons, again here. And again, we had to uh, provide fatigue data, do fatigue testing on these to make sure they complied. Interestingly, this bridge was listed, lifted into place in one piece, so it's constructed off-site here, lifted into one uh, in one piece. Uh, again, the shackles holding up this bridge are also made by Anker Schroeder uh, via a different supplier. But again, nice view of that bridge there. But again, as you can imagine, safety critical. These bridges are going; these trains, sorry, are running over this bridge, maybe um, five or six times an hour. So uh, fatigue, very important for these. Uh, this is a job uh, supplied to in Spain. Uh, this is via our partner VSL in Spain. Again, what I like about these bridges is the elegant um, nature of these. Uh, this is on um, part of the new uh, Sierra Nevada motorway. And so it's just for relieving really the congestion around the, the town. Again, we supplied stressing turnbuckles so each of these tie rods could be uh, pre-loaded using a special rig we can also uh, hire out or uh, some specialist um, stressing companies also have their own for that uh, we've done a number of bridges in belgium over the canals again uh, m85 m100 tie rods and for this particular uh, test the engineer was very was concerned enough about quality to make sure. So he, uh, he insisted we have independent third party inspectors, which was no problem. So they came to our works, they looked at the manufacturer, they took away random samples, and they made tests on material. Now this is a, a bridge very close to our factory, which is great because uh, obviously we made the, the, the tie rods the hangers here. These are, uh, again, these forged trapezoidal ends. So we supplied eight of these hangers, 220 diameter, and the ends were uh, forged to a 585 mil diameter uh, length, sorry, allowing nice horizontal welding, both sides and on-site NDT testing. Again, an interesting way of erecting the bridge, uh, made off-site and then lifted into place. Another road bridge, again, you've seen this shot before, the bridge in Northern Ireland. Again, just showing how the stress is put into the tie rods. So any pre-stress you want to put maybe a pre-cambo into the deck can be done quite easily with this type of equipment. Now the bridge over the Thames, again, allows nice sequential erection of the deck. So you put the hangers in place and just uh, lift the, the deck pieces into place. Again, stressing can be completed very easily and very quickly on site. Again, 
always had to do tensile testing for this project. So this, this tie rod has already been loaded to 2 million cycles, and then a simple tensile test is performed to make sure it meets the proof load. Now I'm showing this bridge here, but we did not supply. These are definitely cables that are being supplied on this bridge here. But what we did supply is 700 tons of anchorage rods to, for the mainstay cables, which are, uh, which are split at the ends, the individual strands. Then we made a connection that connects to the strands and then go back into uh, uh, the frost blocks at the end. So we had to supply a very ductile steel, high ductility because it's a high seismic area. And, uh, and that was a successful project for us. Uh, just to finish off now, although this is not a bridge, it's a building, but it's a building inspired by a bridge, which is why I really like this building in London. The problem they had with this building is the underground, you can see the sign there, runs underneath. So no piles were allowed or columns to come down from this face here. Everything had to be in air, so to speak. So this is a design that the engineer came up. You can see the central block and then these two cantilever buildings off here. And this was inspired by, you, many of you may have heard of the fourth bridge in Scotland. This is inspired by this bridge. So again, I always like this Victorian shot here, showing the guise of the forces in principle, but the same forces in this building here. So I do like that building. So very architecturally um, imposing, I think. But again, you see all our tie rods here holding up on these um, these are trusses here. So just to conclude and in summary, uh, when you're looking at your tie bar systems, uh, we realized and quite right, there are several standard systems on the market. They all offer similar diameters and low capacity. But some of the key issues you should check really is if they're giving you design resistance, is it using the right factors for your design? Is fatigue an issue? Can test data be provided? Should it be checked? Uh, the manufacturer control, uh, it's very important you know, the control, that the manufacturer's control to the correct quality. Uh, if you're using EN 1090, it's a very handy uh, assessment guide you can use. As an independent check, if it has something like uh, an ETA, that's also a good uh, thing to check. And if Clevis ends are used, just have a warning bell to ask about what the quality regime and what the NDT testing is of that. I just have a, uh, an open mind to question that. So really in conclusion, we'd say when you're specifying or looking at your structural tie rods, really use the correct material. Uh, don't have too high a strength, I would say. Definitely don't go over 690 type grade. Don't use uh, like pre-stressing bar type grades. Uh, do your fatigue assessment. Certainly, if there's dynamic loads, uh, check alignment of your connections. They go in the, the line of force. Ensure your specification includes checks for quality control of castings. Uh, specify fabrication standard. And uh, one of our most important points would say is always specify your performance criteria. Don't simply say uh, tie rods by Anker Schroeder M90. Tell the contractor what you expect them to perform to and then he's got a good chance of making an equal comparison. And I would say, if your structure is critical, uh, then insist on production testing, if not full scale testing on some of the products. So thank you very much. That's the end of uh, my talk. I hope you found uh, some information there useful. I'd be very happy to help you with any specific inquiries you've got. Uh, thank you again for your time and the opportunity to uh, present to you. Um, I enjoyed it and I hope uh, hopefully you did too. So I'm open to any questions. My colleagues, uh, Ralph and Opkar and Axel will also be available to help with that. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, Dr. Collins, uh, uh, that uh, information is not only useful and I should say it was a very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation uh, basically. And uh, that is, uh, a very comprehensive presentation Thank indeed. You. And uh, in fact, you have covered all the aspects like the use, usage of this tie bars, design criteria, production quality controls, and uh, what are the areas one has to concentrate as far as the production is con considered. 
particularly of the clavis as well as the folk area mm. where casting has to be done properly and also some of the failure modes and uh, you explained uh, uh, so well and it was so comprehensive i never thought to start with you said that you are going to make a 15 minutes presentation on the tyrods i was not <laughs> expecting it i was not uh, uh, prepared for that mm. i was thinking that the presentation would be over in 30 minutes but it is mm. very very comprehensive okay. very informative and uh, and also how this tyrods can be used in uh, Uh, in 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 conceptualizing some beautiful aesthetically pleasant uh, you know art 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 bridges that also you have you have said that and uh, 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 very very interesting presentation indeed and uh, uh, there are some experts uh, here uh, among us uh, uh, who have uh, in, who were involved in the steel uh, uh, art bridges uh, like mr bobe was involved and uh, Mm-hmm. Mr. Uh, Ravindra Goyal, who has been uh, involved in the steel structure, uh, steel bridges construction and design for a long time, and of course our uh, favorite Dr. Harshvardhan Subbarao, and uh, who will be certainly will be able to give some uh, inputs and uh, enlighten on some other issues, uh, that some of the issues on the tyres also. I uh, take this opportunity to invite Mr. Bobe. I think uh, before taking any questions, I'm not seeing many questions. Only one question is there. and uh, mr bobe i think uh, you have an extensive experience in uh, designing and executing some of the art bridge tied art bridges uh, you had made the wonderful presentation on other day and uh, uh, how do you uh, see that these tie bars uh, can be used as a suspended suspenders in the art tie bar art bridges and what is the scope for, uh, for us to be used in the future can you just uh, uh, give your comments on that so i think you know like you have mentioned we have been using these bars already for quite a number of years now um, especially for tied arches uh, especially for couple of bow strings that we have done we have also used these um, tie rods but the main issue here is what uh, dr jacobs mentioned is that you can't confuse this between a pre stressed uh, rod and a, and a and a anchor bar Yeah, pretty bars. Yes, yes. Completely yes. different things. Yes. Uh, a lot of times, what happens is you actually uh, need some sort of pre-stressing in it, uh, and then people confuse between uh, a tie bar and mm-hmm. a tie rod and 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 a pre-stressing member, pre-stressed member, uh, and that results in the contractor coming up with all kinds of funny uh, ideas. Yes. Yep. You know, after he's awarded the work because he has not understood what exactly is needed. Mm-hmm. you might specify and write all the english you want but if the contractor has not understood what exactly is to be provided then it can lead to confusion so at that point it has to be borne in mind especially when you are doing uh, tied arches network arches um conventional bow strings also uh, you know a lot of times i've seen people wanting to put some pre stress onto those rods and then it becomes impossible because they have ordered uh, tie rods and now they want pre stress to be put in So mm. it becomes, yes uh, becomes a problem mm. uh, but i think it was a wonderful exposition of of all the techniques that can be adopted using tie rods um and maybe uh, the other gentleman here can also throw some light based on their experiences thanks yeah, yeah. so thank you for your comments uh, abhiji and uh, and uh, 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 ravindra goel has uh, designed and uh, executed some of the beautiful uh, i know like the steel bridges uh, for the railways uh, do you have any experience of using the tie bars uh, goel sir or your observation on today's presentation uh, i uh, okay uh, very good afternoon everybody yeah. uh, i would say it is a beautiful presentation uh, i have been slightly late to uh, attend this presentation but most of the main part i have got it so uh, the important thing is that they have uh, covered each and every aspect of uh, a prefabricated tie rod or tie bar so you can say involving uh, including the fatic categories i am particularly happy the way they have shown the sn curve uh, of euro code showing the fatic category of 50 which i feel is good enough very very safe very uh, uh, correct 50 category is very very acceptable of course 110 category for threaded bolt that i have got some doubt uh, that they have mentioned that uh, probably mm. they are also not convinced with that mm. and uh, the revelation for me is that 
the whole tip galvanization it reduces the fatigue resistance this is a new thing for me to learn because quite often people think that uh, by doing uh, hot dip galvanizing they are adding to the strength of the connection by uh, mm. making it yeah. anti yeah. corrosion resistant but in this case you're stress relieving the yeah, the, the root area it yeah. is uh, going to reduce the fatigue uh, characteristic so this mm. is a new revelation for me mm. uh, thank you for that and of course by uh, you have mentioned that uh, rolled threading is better than the mechanical th machine threading that is very natural anybody mm. would accept that and uh, but otherwise you have covered the ndt aspect uh, and the casting you have also mentioned the different type of tests in casting uh, and then uh, you have also mentioned that uh, uh, the ndt is probably more expensive mm -hmm. and uh, that's why you go for destructive testing that is less costlier that is also acceptable but my point is then can we have a kind of a quality assurance plan Showing the different stresses, different uh, processes, and what kind of test can be specified, and what can be what can be the acceptance criteria for each and every. Yeah, uh, well, that's in, in the in the model specification. We we have yeah, some information yeah. on that. You must be having some standard for that, I think. And mm. if something can yeah. be standardized, then it will be very handy for anybody okay. to yeah. uh, get him uh, to convince him. And uh, of course, performance criteria you have talked about that is very important. Uh, as such uh, in railway we are not uh, going uh, we are not using such kind of tie rods prefabricated tie rods very frequently but i can see some applications like we have mm -hmm. uh, also designed some standard bowstring girders where the verticals we are having made up of uh, steel sections box sections so that can be replaced by this kind of prefabricated uh, tie rod mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, one thing about the railway designs is that we always look for some kind of a redundancy like yes. you have uh, you have specified some cases of uh, snapped uh, tie tie bars tie rods so uh, if uh, that can happen uh, then it will be very uh, detrimental uh, for the people using uh, this mm -hmm. kind of a structure so we would prefer that if some kind of redundant that that is to, basically that is the job to be taken up by the designer if the mm -hmm. designer can provide some kind of a diagonal also in addition to the verticals probably that can be taken care of so uh, basically it will be a uh, involved job involving the manufacturers of this kind of rods and the designers and the uh, executors so a lot of uh, work has to be done before we actually go for this kind of a uh, tie rod mm -hmm. but i can see a good future for this kind of a product uh, even in railways so thank you very much for a nice presentation once thank again thank you thank you Thank you, thank you, uh, Engineer Goyal, and I see uh, Dr. Collins' uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Mr. Axel as well as Mr. Raffle, right? They, they seem to be there in the panel, and uh, any one of them would like to complement uh, Dr. Collins' presentation by adding uh, some more information, Mr. Axel, or uh, Mr. Raff, you can go yourself first. After that, I'll come to Axel. Raf, you're on mute. I'm mute. I'm mute. Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon to India from uh, from Germany. We are here in the head office, as mentioned earlier. Uh, Colin Jacobs is the the only guy who is not working from Germany. He's located in uh, Sheffield in the United Kingdom, still a part of Europe, although. Uh, we have Brexit, but uh, still a member of the family, and we are happy that the UK is still accepting the the Euro code. <laughs> and um, I think let's say one 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 key lesson that uh, that that Colin let's say would like to to bring over um, to to you engineers is when we see failures in structures, not only in bridges, but uh, as Colin mentioned, our key business is the anchorage of uh, sheet piles, anchorage material for key walls, and so on. Uh, we think most failures are caused because of um, not specific enough uh, specifications. So I think this is really key that you as a specifying engineer should be very precise to the contractor what is the expectation. 
Um, the, the, one of your, your, uh, the members just mentioned, let's say, that there's sometimes uh, discussions between the contractors, what is really specified? Do we have to use a pretension bar? Can we use a structural bar that must be pretensioned? It's a completely different material, completely different tie bar. So the more precise you are in your specification, the less uh, doubts you will have the less uh, opportunities the contractors will have to go as cheap as possible in their purchase. And uh, you will uh, consider, let's say, that uh, contractors are always in competition. So they will always try to find the cheapest available material. So the more precise you are in your specification, the most unlike it will be that your structure will fail. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, Mr. Raffin, you can go ahead. This was my, 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 my key point. And uh, I must also say, congrats, uh, Colin, was a, was a great presentation. Yeah, Thank that you. was indeed. Uh, that yes. was a great presentation. And also, uh, Mr. Bobby also, like you, brought out the distinction between the PT bars as well as the tire, tire rods, which has been used, which has been well brought out for our uh, view, viewers as well as the participants also, so that they're very careful when they're using the bars. Tire rods uh, serves the different functions, and the PT bars serves the so the different function. Basically, this tie rods are not meant to be pre-stressed. Perhaps that's the point uh, everybody is making here. Uh, well taken. Mr. Axel, you want to add something? You have to unmute. Unmute. Unmute yourself. It's not visible on my monitor. So uh, <laughs> again, hello, gentlemen. Hi, also from my side, congratulations. It's very interesting, this presentation. I also want to add what Colin uh, mentioned uh, several times. I think beside all the aspects we heard from Colin and also from Ralph, which is very important regarding the specification, it's still the most important point that you have a very good look and uh, you see it as a key point. This is a quality aspect. So that means you need exactly to know where you get the material, where you can rely on, what are your reliable partners in uh, um, yeah, production of these materials and of course in the end it's uh, also very important that you make an in-house check all on all these parts you can get from from your suppliers that you are sure that the material is okay and therefore of course it's uh, very very important always on all parts that you have a topic uh, regarding these quality aspects thank you thank you uh, mr excel and uh, dr harsha is uh, it's our uh, own doctor who has done his doctorate in perhaps uh, the structural steel. That's what I came to know last time when he was talking in one of the webinars. And I'm sure he, he, will, he will have uh, many things to add to your presentation, Dr. Colin. Harsha, it's yeah. your turn. Yeah, greetings, Colin, uh, from a fellow Hello. Uh, a PhD from the UK, uh, yeah. juxtaposing to our Brexit friends. Yeah. But <laughs> we're all one family. When it comes to steel, we're yeah. all united anyway. Exactly. And the world is far too small to allow Brexit to interfere mm. in, uh, you know, yep. innovation. And let's be very clear about that. Mm. These are trivialities. Okay. Now let's talk about the issue that govern us all, which is our love for structures. Mm -hmm. Our love for structures and these beautiful structures that can be created from the use of very slender thyroid elements, lending to transparency, lending to an aesthetic look, and lending to a lightness and feeling of a structure, which, uh, you know, which, which makes people who use or see the structure uh, uh, very much, uh, uh, let's say, they feel uplifted. That's, exactly. That's what I agree. We're doing. That's I what agree. we're doing as engineers, right? That's our goal as engineers. Mm -hmm. To give to society something which lends to beauty and something which lends to the upliftment of its use. You know, when you use that structure, you feel delighted. That's what we're about. So that's where I think the tie rod comes in. That's where I think that even if it's tensioned or non-tensioned, that's the secondary aspect. But as a tie rod functioning in tension, it, 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 it tends to be, you know, tensile structure is always something which uh, anything in tension is thin, anything in tension lends to beauty. Right? It doesn't matter where it is, whichever form of tension structure that you take. So coming to today's talk, I mean, I found it very, very interesting. Uh, Anchor Schroeder is the oldest firm uh, manufacturing these products. They are a legendary company, which we all know about, but very small uh, step, uh, you know, very small footprint in India. Till uh, Mr. Ukkar Raut suddenly decided to happen upon us with this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, you know, this product, product stream. Now, coming to the codes, what, how do we involve uh, greater confidence in its use? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. 
the railway on the one hand will not allow us to use these rods at all they want mm -hmm. rigid they want rigid uh, you know in place of our, uh, our suspender uh, what they call suspenders or what anybody would call a suspender rod in simple yes. terms okay so they want something which is rigid they will not allow that is they do not have a single railway bridge which has a tie rod structure now come to the point where atul and me are involved in four projects and i know two projects and i'm involved in two others we are all using uh, these rods maybe from your competitor or now maybe from mm -hmm. utkars come you know uh, now that utkars uh, propagating these products of yours in this country now the the, the points that happen are the following we don't have a codal specification at all for its use you know it's a willy nilly type of use it's a and the onus comes upon the consultant to be brave mm -hmm. that i don't think is fair because the risk allocation is uncertain and bold consultants like atul and me do use it and we're using it in the city of bombay for example on a very important mahim causeway we're using it for a 110 meter arch which i have designed and you know uh, and we're also using it uh, on krishna on a river on krishna which has 10 spans in karnataka on 10 spans of uh, you know two parallel two, two, two roadways two carriageways and 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 we are using it but there is a there is a shortage of code guidance be it in the manufacture be it in the assessment be it in the choice or be it in uh, your long term maintenance or be it for example in the assessment of fatigue mm -hmm. now we don't have clear guidance now fatigue is not the issue of the rod alone philip the most important failure mode in this case it's a tension element is fatigue there, there, there can be no there can be no doubt about it and the fatigue assessment for the joint is the principal thing and the joint is left to the consultant you know there is no a normative guidance for the joint design and that's where you guys enter you all have to help us with the joint design which i find completely lacking whether it's you whether it's dextra whether it's vsl they just do not involve themselves in the design of the joint mm -hmm. now that's the weakest link in the chain which prevents us from using this product so if we want to improve the use of this product the joint has to be integral with the product and the fatigue assessment has to be at the joint level it's not only the member the it is the joint which will undergo the maximum fatigue it's not the rod so testing a rod is insufficient it's testing the system which is important in the way it is used so you're talking so, the well the world of the connection the wells like the, whole of the structure. connections yeah. absolutely the wells yep. of the connection and the performance criteria requirement for those mm -hmm. that are lacking in any of our codes and and we don't have guidance about that when we go to your product catalog so this is where the 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 the, the issue lies and i would like you all to address this so that we could uh, then bring this into a codal guideline because these are lovely structures that we can build you know i mean the failure mm -hmm. modes are one thing we can design out the failure modes provided we have the guidance uh, uh, the performance specs is one aspect understanding the failure modes is a second aspect but designing them out will come from codal guidance which is lacking which doesn't exist actually in india so here is where i want to put to you an involvement with the iib here is what i want to put to you an involvement with the irc that's the codal making body in the country mm -hmm. there is an absolute need to look at it as an integral fashion okay the, the joint plus the rod and the structural behavior and when it is used how the performance characteristics and the performance specifications that we require for the product so i i request you call in and all my other friends are here uh, that are here from germany ralph and what would be of use is to help us design those performance requirements uh and uh, let's arrive at some standards and some do's and don'ts at least that if not anything else at least some do's and don'ts in a checklist mm -hmm. for the designer so that we get it right a priori you know but let's look at that this is my request i, I know how far yeah. to go I wonder if um, Axel, do you have any comments on that? Because you you're the one most involved with um, this. It's still, it's still the question now. So, do we are talking about uh, tie rods? That means prefabricated tie rods with with clevis at uh, the connection end, or do we talk about welded constructions? No, you're talking about the, the clevis connects obviously yeah, to a, yeah, yeah. A, the uh, plates yeah, yeah. on the host structure, which generally yeah, the fabricator yeah. supplies. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, Dr. Sabura's uh, question is. What is the guidance on the weld for the connection plate to the structure? Yeah, but this is normally no information we got. No, but... I, I, I think uh, I, I think 
uh, uh, Mr. Axel, what uh, I think as far as the thyroid is concerned, you are right. I think it's about the fork as well as the clevis. As far as the you know connection of the welding to this of uh, uh, plate to that, I think it's uh, it it has to follow any other detailed category which is there in the code. But regarding the clevis and fork connection to that of the tie rod yeah. and uh, what detailing category it belongs to that's a question here in my opinion so the, this let's say this is more or less easy for us to answer because we had a, a lot of have had lot, done a lot of tests in the past especially for these parts from smaller diameters up to bigger diameters and as colin also mentioned before uh, especially for this uh, fork and type uh, m48 we did a lot of research um, at that size but uh, beside that, so for most of the of the uh, structures we delivered for our parts, we were also uh, requested to make these fatigue testing. That means two million cycle tests. So that means we have a wide range from smaller diameters up to maximum M100, where we carried out in the past these tests up to two million cycles, always with a positive result. And this is, of course, what we can um, more or less maybe collect and give this information to the planners. This could be an idea, but beside that, of course, we don't have, uh, yeah, let's say, any more arguments as uh, that we mostly follow the uh, EC3. But beside this, Colin mentioned it before in his um, uh, in his presentation, the 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 uh, uh, notch category or the the class category in Germany is more or less uh, restricted up to 50 newton per millimeter square. Or for screws, for bigger screws, it's also it has to be downsized to to 30 or 25 newton per millimeter square. But what we did or see from the uh, experience and from the tests we made in the past, we mostly are in the range of 75 up to 90 newton per millimeter square as a stress range. Yeah. So it's more or less close to the recommendation uh, of EC3 with 105, but normally this is not the requirement from the customer size because they also made their own calculation and say in the end, of course, we are happy with 60, 75 or 90 Newton per millimeter square. But this is what we can collect and make it more briefly in a, in a small presentation just, just to show Okay, uh, what kind of diameters have we already tested? At what level? At what uh, um, uh, stress range, and so on? This is what we can provide. Yeah. Oh, I, th yeah, I thought. Uh, very good. Can I yeah, can yeah, I yeah. join in? Yeah, can please. I, so it's it's wonderful, uh, Alex, that these points have been discussed. The, the 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 real limitation comes into the joint. Yeah. It's not the rod. Correct. That's mm -hmm. the point I'm making repeatedly. Mm -hmm. You can test it for as much as you want. 10 million cycles of your rod has no meaning when the joint is insufficient. Correct. So the integrity, the use of the element comes in only when the joint is integral. Otherwise, the element is useless. Let's be very clear about it. So Absolutely. unless we delve on the joint as an integral component of the rod, we are not going to win. Correct. We are not going to win. Yeah. And we want to win because we want these beautiful <laughs> structures to be with us. You know, that's but the point I, I, I'm making. Yeah. I would love to use it if I had some guidance on the integrity of the joint with the rod, yeah. and the fact that uh, you know the rod may be very, very able to be you know the, the SN curve and the the, the 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 category may be very clear, but the joint lends us into some uh, ambiguity, and that is where I would like uh, some debate. No, Asha, 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 I think it's not very clear when you say join between the rod and what? No, the parent this member is... and the rod, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Suppose you took, look at it as a gusset plate uh -huh. and your rod yeah. has gone onto a gusset plate. It's the gusset to the main member which will govern many a time, not the rod. No, it's, it it's may not be a... the rod which is important, but yeah. uh, the, the, the joint is very, very critical. No, but I, I think as far as that joint is concerned, it is applicable to any joint instead of uh, yes. rod you have another steel also that detailing category is available i yes. think yes. the most critical Correct. thing is yes. it's between the fork clevis and the rod Absolutely. rather than the joint and the rod joint and the rod is already available detailing categories yeah. are available because the joint but, is still a, a, a very yes. standard steel yeah, applicable sta standard uh, steel application Correct. Yes. If I can yeah. summarize, is, is this correct? Mm -hmm. Obviously, we, we've talked about fatigue here, correct. but yes. what I think Dr. I'm Sabura talking is talking about, about is this joint here. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, this? because yeah. invariably, yeah. invariably, the joint is very particular to the geometry which we assume for the rod. Inclined or whether it's using a tight arch or whatever, 
that joint becomes a very important aspect. Isn't that but, a standard but, detail but, in but when yeah. we get, codes? When we get to the joint, so the joint has more or less the highest class, eh? the highest mm. class of, mm. of uh, notch classes. So you're talking about yeah. 140, maybe I think the biggest mm. one is 165. But compared to that, we are talking about for the rod itself or for the connection and the threaded part. This is more or less the weakest point. Correct, right. correct. No, not, the the fork, not the fork end, not, not the fork end, not the tie bar, but yeah. still the area around the thread. That means the weakest yes. part is always this uh, this area and you will see it in every in every uh, um, fatigue test and in every subsequent brake load test you have always the failure in the thread area but um, yes. you don't have any problems with the joint because the joint is much more higher in its resistance and its calculations uh, compared to the uh, compared to the cross section of the tie rod yeah that's a, that's a good explanation uh, yeah. mr axel and uh, yeah. now let us move on to can I, just, can I just intervene for a second? Yeah. I just want to correct uh, an impression that people have. Yes. Um, because I think somebody mentioned that the railways are very conservative and therefore they don't permit rods to be used. Yeah. I just want to correct that impression. I think if I remember right, the third Godavari bridge at Rajmandri. Correct, correct, correct. 94 yeah. to 97. It's a 100 meter bowstring arch done by the railways. It's designed by Leonard Andra and Partners, if I remember right, executed by Hindustan Construction. 100 meter spans, bowstring girders, and they are using BBR rods there. They are, if I remember right, it's BBR tension rods. It's, it's the first application, in fact, of tension rod for such a long span. It was done by the Indian Railways and it was done in India. It, it was it, 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 yeah, it's not only long span, it's a multi span. Yes, it's a multi span. It's, it's, a, it's a numerous spans of 100 meters. Absolutely, so I thought the yeah. impression needs to be corrected that railways does not use rods. It does. It's just that the current bowstring design that Railways has has been done by RBSO and it's more of a bowstring truss. It's not a bowstring yes. arch because the vertical yes. members are not really rods. They are actually steel members. So it's like a Virendale truss, uh, if I can call it that. I mean, I'm extending the theory of Virendales, but it's actually a Virendale truss, uh, if I can call it that. Second, yeah. Isha is mentioning about the, uh, about the joint is well taken because you know the the weak link is actually not the bar but it's actually the joint but i think looking for guidance from the bar manufacturer would be a little uh, extending it a little too much because i think that innovation and creativity must lie with the structural designer he must decide uh, how the joint will be and whether he wants it welded he wants it um, riveted whatever and, and that flexibility must be left with the designer. You can't codify each and everything and put everything in the Euro code or in the Indian codes. Uh, and then what will the designer do? If everything is written in English in the code, you don't need a designer, right? You just need the code and you put it there. Yeah, I, I think that's well said. No, uh, my, uh, my point, the, uh, the point I was making was what inhibits, you know, that the, these are structures which should, we should be designing. You and me are using it in at least two, three of our structures that we are Either you're designing, I'm checking, or you're, I'm designing, you're checking in Bombay itself. Yeah. So we are bold enough to do that. But to encourage others to come into that, you know, we, we need to address the issue at large. If the Harsha, if plus the me, I'm, plus going the share, form. I'm going to share a drawing if you allow me. I don't know if I can yeah, share the screen. Um, uh, if it's possible, yes, I can share it. I'm just going to share the screen to show you one of the joint drawings that I happen to have on this computer. So, so that's, that's, I don't know if you can see the screen. Yes, yeah. we can. We can. So that's, that's a drawing of a joint, um, which is to take, uh, which is to take the, uh, the, 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 the rod eventually. And, 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 and that's the detail when it sits on top of the, on the, of the, of the bottom boom, on the bottom, yeah. Boom, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Bobe, Bobe, sir. Bobe, Mr. Bobe, yes. here. This joint is not particularly, you know, in relationship to the rod which you are using. It is for any structure. Exactly. This detailing category exactly. is available in the course. I exactly. Think. Yes. And only the screw is most weakest point. Absolutely. Rather than this joint, the Correct. screw in the within the clevis Absolutely. as well as the you know fork is the weakest uh, joint in my opinion. In sure. particular, in this particular case, they have already given the detailing category of around 30 or something like that, 30 newton per millimeter square or something like that, what I can see. I think that explains, I think you are, you are given a very good explanation, Bobe, so I think that, that should clarify the many of the, you know, uh, the, the issues which has been raised by uh, Dr. Harsha. Now I'll call upon uh, 
uh, our uh, president uh, vinay gupta ji are you there vinay gupta sir absolutely there but i was muted by somebody so i remain muted <laughs> no no i uh, meanwhile i i request uh, 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 dr roy to carry on with the discussions along with mr vinay gupta because i'll have to take excuse myself i have to join a meeting at 5:30 i think dr roy you'll have to take it over take it over yes sir anyway. and it's I, pleasure I, sir let me thanks to you yeah, i think the such, such a uh, tough subject you have made into a very simple <laughs> and uh, really uh, remarkable uh, way of your handle thank you hegde uh, sahab for really this this is subject which is known to uh, very few experts and all and you have taken and you have taken all the uh, technical part in a very live mode thank you very much sir thank you i think before leaving i would like to congratulate once again uh, dr colin for such an uh, comprehensive presentation i told you that i didn't expect this only on the tie rod the presentation can be made for bana <laughs> very excellent presentation very comprehensive i think i'll take you very much I'll, i'll take your leave with that thank you please sir thank you sir thank you very much thank you thank you mr thank you sir yes sir vinay gupta sir over to you ah yes yes so i think uh, dr colin uh, jacob i think your presentation was really well detailed out and that's very important and that's what we want in iib mm -hmm. i mean we, we don't say that you just make a some cross presentation an overview and this and that yeah there are many people who would do that but when it comes to detailing out things this is the right way that uh, you presented and we have also been involved in several of uh, bridges which are like this the mm -hmm. same way although they are foot over bridges in our case but what i see one of the important points of course we talked about uh, fatigue and dr harshavardhan took on many things about it uh is about also the uh, not only okay one is the fork the fork that supports uh, and the bolt type of a thing the pin mm -hmm. the fork has to have its own strength although you are doing this uh, two million cycle test and all that but you know the i mean one is a normal working other is slightly accidental working let's say a vehicle hits supposing it's a bridge mm -hmm. and the yep. vehicle hits sideways right yep. when the vehicle hits sideways there is a certain amount of uh, impact that comes on the bridge at that time also my uh, this uh, suspension rod must be safe and when mm -hmm. i say rod main rod is fine it will remain safe normally speaking but the fork Mm -hmm. should not open out now whatever no. i know that the thread that is um, that is put around the pin uh, through which it is tightened the nut uh, the washer and therefore there after the nut is only about one and a half thread if i'm not wrong so this if it's really so then it's a very small distance and that accuracy precision is extremely important to make sure that in those conditions of uh, a sideways thrust or something our whole thing does not come off and there were some apprehensions in one of the accidents here in delhi that uh, perhaps the fork opened out because uh, some transverse force would have been there during construction yep. Yep. it may be right it may be wrong nobody can really make out you know after an accident or yep. after a failure mm -hmm. but yep. there were apprehensions so that's where we learned that's very important to have enough strength of this fork and the uh, mm -hmm. uh, system of the bolt and yep. the nut but So but often you get, please. yeah, but often you can get the if the pin and the bar are put into excessive bending, the pin will bend, and you do get this prying force on the pin caps, which is what I think you're talking about. So you get a prying force on the pin caps, which then is only retained by a fairly small screw, let's say you know uh, an M8, M10, whatever, and so. Once it, the structure has gone that far with the pin bending, it's technically failed anyway. I mean, it'd be hard to design it to retain such a, a big force. I mean, we we have done the past axle, haven't we? We have uh, put bolts, bolted type ends through rather than a, a pin cap. Yeah, where the designer has recognised that he's at risk of that type of failure, so he asks specifically for a more robust uh, end restraint, if you like, to the pin. Yeah. Yeah, but ordinarily, yep. you wouldn't see that happen, even in an accidental case, yeah. because you know, the, the, the fork would be protected also by the gusset plate itself from too much movement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. If your pin is designed correctly, it shouldn't bend yeah, under yeah. the full load capacity of the bar. Right. And if the pins start bending, then your bar should have started yielding 
and you've probably got bigger problems than the pin caps then yeah but can it happen that the fork bends out the fork fork opens out and it forces the pin to open it, it uh, can it can the... if the gusset plate is designed incorrectly yeah okay okay yeah or if so the base of the pin has not, failed in bending it. Or, so the clevis, uh, or the clevis are not properly quenched and tempered. Yeah. Yes, as, yeah. Yeah. as, as, as yeah. we learned before. Yeah, but okay. assuming that all, all materials are correct, generally it can, it can be down correct. to the gusset plate, which is incorrect width perhaps, or yeah. maybe yeah. not aligned. If it's put in the, the clevis into too much bending, yeah. it's not. Yeah. You know, the connection plate has to be in the line of force. Right, but maybe no. there's also there's also um, very important information about our own system or or the the ASTO system, tension bar system. So mainly it's designed. So in in the past it designed for for a high strength bar material. That means actually we are using a mild steel 540 yield strength. This is our standard range. Okay. But but the complete system is designed for a high strength material. That means for a yield strength of 690 properties for the bar. Additional to this 690, we have an additional safety in the material because this is a design criteria at the time of 1.375. So that means we have additional 37.5% safety capacity in the fork end compared to the maximum load capacity of the tie bar. So we have a very high resistance in the material that's because uh, there will never be a failure in the in the in the parts for for clevis as long of course as they are properly quenched and tempered but this is really no risk point in the complete structure the risk point is always the uh, threaded part of the tie bar the other very uh, natural question is about the length uh, we calculate certain length in the uh, say design in our computer software or whatever and then it is manufactured and supplied. What is the cushion that is provided or that's available? That is when you are um, uh, uh, when you are tightening the um, the fork with the rod. Uh, there must be some leeway as to how much it can be adjusted if so required. Uh, is it, there one? Yeah, there's certainly each fork has in built into it um, about uh, one diameter of adjustment. So plus or okay. minus half a diameter. So with two fork ends, you've got plus or minus okay. a diameter. And okay. but the additional uh, uh, length, you should always put a turnbuckle in. If you're worried about your uh, length adjustment, have a turnbuckle and turnbuckles can be made to suit the project. Typically, we allow plus or minus 50, but we could also do plus or minus 100. Yeah? Yep. Okay. So it, it, that, that's the safest way. Um, I mean, but most structures or these types of bridges are fabricated to fairly tight tolerances. Mm. Yep. Generally, most decent fabricators would be able to do uh, a good enough tolerance but for most bridges i would suggest you always put a turnbuckle in because it gives you further option oh, safety and allows you to put a bit of pre-stress in if you wish right right well it's something like uh, button-headed um, uh, wires of uh, bbr which are exactly the length that you give and they provide yeah but here that, at least we're better that off that there difficult. is a certain uh, yeah, yeah. available yeah, that makes it too difficult for the guys on site. I mean, right. you, you can be the best fabricator in the world, but you still need some <laughs> tolerance. Yeah? That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You do need it, yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Vinay Gupta, sir. Uh, I think there are questions already we have taken up. Uh, Upkarji, Shafkar Raut. Uh, before we go, vote of thanks. Let me hear from your side. Anything uh, from your side you can add up? And Gopal, before you close, has the question been replied? There's one question in the QA box. Yeah, I think that has been taken up. But okay. if uh, Fine. There, there is a, actually, uh, Dr. Colin, there's, there's a, one question is called Can you elaborate on use of origin of C standards? Uh, I think maybe. So. So we say that the use, I mean, obviously in Europe, it's a legal requirement due to the construction products directive that we have to use, uh, uh, we have to supply products to CE standard, yeah? uh, which basically the, the European Union tried to harmonize all, pros, all products, all services or whatever, in whatever aspects of life, whether it's your television, your refrigerator, your car, your uh, tie bar, uh, to have a common a statement that they reach a common manufacture standard and performance criteria. 
So there are very strict rules you have to apply by to say uh, you have to tell the end user what the performance of that product will be. Yep. So it is a legal requirement in Europe. So uh, we are we just, it's second nature to us to apply those rules now. And generally, we will apply exactly the same rules to any product around the world. Uh, it may just not go with the formal certification we have to provide in, in Europe, but if the customer asks, it's not a problem for us to also supply CE marks to anywhere in the world. Yep. And it does ensure you get all the products with the safety checks that comes with. So the, the origin, I think, is a bit more difficult with the history of that, but I think it was just, uh, it's always been the aim of the European Union to have harmonized products. So you have equal and fair competition between states. Yeah? So and the CE you, mark is a way of doing that. Do, do you specify any any standards, any number or any, any, any like uh, specific uh, standard so that they can refer to that part also? Uh, yes, so you, you, all you have to ask for is uh, uh, must be supply CE marked. And because of the type of product we're supplying, we know exactly what standards that has to meet. So it's a very simple specification to say, you know, if you can say must be made to EN 1090, which is what we have to confer with, or must be CE marked, and then we know we have to supply it in accordance with the European technical approval we have, which was an okay. independent series of tests we had to go through an independent lab to prove that our products met the performance criteria we specify. So it's a very expensive process, but one that's necessary in Europe. So do you, do you follow all your C2 plus type work for all your factory production control as well as initial type testing and all that uh, for each of your batches or how do you do it? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's all uh, batch controlled, if you like, but it depends on the execution level of the projects. Yeah. So if you're doing a project uh, for bridge requires execution class four, that's in accordance with the Euro codes, then we will individually track each product on an individual basis with uh, identification marks and we'll have it fully traceable. If it's execution class two, we're allowed to do it as a batch. So we can say we've made 300 of those and they're all made to the same standard. Right. Yeah. But you won't know, each one won't be individually marked. Yeah, we know what batch it comes from, but we won't know the individual item. Whereas execution class four, we will know each individual item and the history of that item. Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, again, same question has been raised. What does C stands for? Uh, yeah, someone who speaks French. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, in English, it means uh, conformity Europe. In yeah, French, yeah. it means conformity yeah. Euro. Yeah. I, I, I don't speak French, but it doesn't. It, it doesn't mean China export, as some people. <laughs> <laughs> it means uh, conformity Europe. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and one of one of uh, one of the big advantages of the design for the designers is if you specify that all products must be CE labeled and you mention EN 10,090 then you don't have to go in too many details in your specification because everything is covered in, in this big uh, uh, package let's say of standards so for example the um, pinhole connections the, the, the surface quality of the pinhole of the gusset plate for example all this is stated in the EN 10,090 mm. so you don't have to reinvent the wheel many mm. of these specifications especially welding are specified in this document so this is let's say it makes it much easier for designers to refer to this. But and if this you will contact, done, yeah. this is especially done for, for, for designing, yes. So for the for the connection parts, not for the tie by itself. So did, would you suggest then that all users of this product in India in the in the in the interim period that we develop our own guidelines? Uh, we suggest that all products, which are the turnbuckles, the, the, the whole product and everything, uh, shall uh, conform to C-labeled uh, EN 1090. Is that an easy way out for us? I would suggest it's an easy way out. Um, right. But it, I say easy, it's a, it's a robust way. Uh, it's a robust way. Sure. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah, say the easy yeah. way, robust yeah, yeah, way. That's yeah, the right way. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it would be, let's say, a good way, but I, I don't know if it's uh, possible from a legal point of view in India, because you will restrict, of course, the, the uh, potential suppliers for these products. Mm. Uh, if you want to label CE, you must have an approval from a European approval body, and maybe not all competitors are able to have this. If you maybe buy from America, they have nothing 
something in, in they, they yeah, don't they know don't the European it. standards, they will have their ASTM mm -hmm. standards. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but if you, let's say, evaluate at the end different uh, products you would like to, to, um, to choose, then this is a criteria definitely uh, that you might specify approved with CE and EN 10,090 or equivalent. And then it's up to the, um, to yeah. the, um, to the others uh, to, to prove that they are on the same, on the same level. Yeah, that's or equivalent. That's a right, nice way of putting it. So we will resort to that yeah. for the infant period. Yeah, and, and therefore we, I would recommend, let's say, that you contact Upka or, or drop us an email. Uh, we will be happy to send you this uh, specification document. It's it's a word document. Uh, we don't have a copyright. You can copy paste, and of course, let's say you can uh, reword it. You can. It, it's not an Anka Schroeder tender document. It gives all the input that Colin has given you. But of course, you can always specify or equivalent. But then you yeah. have. Let's say also like a guideline uh, that you can use to to prove if it's really equivalent what others are offering and you can ask the, the, the right questions for example if we specify um, a certain level of um, acceptance criteria for castings you can ask others what is your criteria and then you have a, um, a way uh, for the evaluation process uh, well, just, just, what, 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 just, to, just to ask you further clarity on that we cannot have a, a bias towards Europe if an American product or a Japanese product is equally available for that particular use. So um, what our equivalent is the way out, that's fine. Uh, but my point really is, uh, how do we ensure the testing is uh, done and it is observed and it's manufactured? Because the testing is not done in India and uh, the facilities for doing this testing do not exist in India. So I, I, Upkar, if you would like to clarify how we go about this so that we can specify a product for use, you know, I mean, how do we get this done? Uh, yeah, so uh, like you rightly mentioned, Dr. Subara, that uh, we are still you know, evolving when it comes to the regulation and the guidelines of this product. So as suggested by many panelists and uh, also you know, reinforced by ASDO team that being a CE mark will be a starting point, but as we evolve with various projects, we should be able to you know, develop the detailing and regulation of our own. So I, I think CE could be a starting point, but then uh, going forward, as we do more and more project references, we can evolve our own industry standard, which are more suitable to our uh, conditions, our construction dynamics, and also the type of construction feasibility available in India. So, so, shall I suggest, uh, Upkar, then that we develop in the IRC committee the use of tie rods in, uh, you know, steel bridges or whatever. Mm -hmm. Why don't we form a separate guideline for that? Bring all of y'all on board as advisors and Upkar, and you know, because we need to develop a com comprehensive yeah. set of guidelines yeah. on how to go about the use of this in design, mm -hmm. and the fact that, of course, you know, the analysis is completely different uh, if you have a rigid member in the middle or a Tie, tie rod member in the middle, in the web members, and also the uh, stability analysis are very much different. So from an engineer's point of view, you know, there are many things that need to be bought out apart from just the use of the tie rod. Stability issues change completely as one can imagine. So um, uh, can we develop, a, a, can you all help us come on board with your specifications and with the SAI model specifications for purchase that we have already, can we then start to evolve a guideline for use of this product in India and on all fronts? That is uh, choice, design guidance, as well as construction issues. Workmanship, I would say most important is workmanship. Yes. Yeah. Can we, can you all help us with that as an appeal? I mean, I mean this is what yeah. we need to, to use yeah. this product more in India, yeah. Yeah, we'd be happy, but obviously, uh, just temper your expectations of how much knowledge we can give you on the aspects outside of tie bods. Yep. Right. Yep. So that's fine. But no, yeah, that's I, I did the same with the Steel Bridges Group in the UK. So right. that about five, six years ago. Yep. So, yep, be very happy to do it again. Yep. Wonderful. So you were involved with the Wharton Bridge, for example, with Chris Henry yes. and that. that yes, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and yeah, exactly. You know them well so then, yeah. <laughs> I go past it so often. Anyway, uh, right yeah. on. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subha. Yeah. I think we were looking, actually, this is a subject which is, uh, I, I will say, uh, it, it goes towards the advancement or the advanced design of the bridge engineering and all. So I will request if uh, Dr. Colin, if you can some, give us some 
example theoretically also and case studies also so that we can share to the, the to the from the consultant to the students so that this can be practiced because people know the the tie rod system but uh, the how to practically design and how to practically uh, implement specifying the projects and some confidence building case study should be there in what loading and all so that will going to help the and really it is uh, uh, looking at the new era and smart city and all this can be used for number of uh, like uh, rob or footover or any kind of things where we can economize the things so mm -hmm. i will request that something you should uh, submit because there is no of course uh, dr harshvardhan subara has told that guideline and all these are the uh, are literally it is not the subject is not still discussed okay so it is practically and you are practicing in india we need some guidance from your side okay i'm sure we can help with that and upkar i think will be a good guy to lead that and uh, with our help we can get that submitted in the right format and content yeah yeah upkar uh, can you can you uh, say looking at the indian scenario and all how how you can add up the and uh, regarding this tie bar system you can uh, like more is like we will say that you have to make comfortable to all the design and consultants so that they can start specifying i think that that is a biggest challenge so on that uh, and in our forum lot of consultants uh, the 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 pioneer consultants are there with us so you have to help out this is a biggest challenge for specification Well, I agree. And like uh, you know, like uh, back in 2016, ICN started uh, something like this with the technical committee guidelines. You know, like first window fiber reinforced concrete. So we are primarily talking something on those lines, right? For for bridge engineering and encompassing every engineering practice that bridge involves. So uh, being a part of you know two committees of ICI, I would be glad to you know continue my uh, participation and contribution in this field also. and uh, i i believe that uh, uh, we have the necessary guidance on this particular topic from asdro who are the inventors of this technology so whatever they can share would obviously be very very fruitful and uh, i would say qualitative and it could be a starting point i i would say so i, I strongly uh, support this argument yeah uh, you need to give some technical backup in the confidence building of the samples and all that will really help our uh, members and all who are attending Uh, so the things are uh, going to be uh, that part so it is the initial homework is uh, and uh, believe me this can be one of the like lot of foot over and metro bridges are coming where uh, actually they need a lightweight and uh, nominal loadings and all but the span is less or more a columnless function they want to go so like, it can be like uh, to the uh, smart cities it will be a really a good part but again Uh, all all comes down to who will approve and who will satisfy who will uh, certify okay so these things need to be taken care i think with this note uh, uh, vinay gupta sir with your permission okay, shall we conclude towards the sure yeah yeah absolutely thank you so, so much uh, and thanks to everybody hmm. let me thanks to uh, dr colin uh, for really uh, like before this lecture uh, i think i was i know the tie rod system but i was not aware that how extensively worldwide and how conceptually and how detailed the things are there i think you have covered the, the theoretical practical and the confidence building uh, need to be taken over by some confidence building papers and guidelines and all so with that note i let me thanks to dr colin jacobs and uh, uh, from anchor and then i i, I would like to thanks uh, the uh, uh, mr rafal relaf then uh, mr excel uh, for supporting and giving all technical backup from their uh, whenever uh, the part and let me specially thanks to mr upkar okay who really from last uh, 10 15 days and uh, but uh, this is just a beginning I, i will say that this is just a beginning this is a starter and you you need to educate us okay and there we can do the things let me also thanks to anchor for sponsoring today's uh, talk and uh, let me thanks to today's uh, uh, moderator uh, engineer vian hegde ji for uh, really like a subject with lot of technical backup and lot of study he has come up and then he has he tried to answer the question with the the speaker and all
thank you uh, engineer hegrej for accepting and uh, moderating this session let me also thanks to uh, our all all the participants who joined for the lecture today and let me thanks to our coordinator ruhi agarwal and deepika singh engineer deepika singh for holding uh, the complete uh, this webinar part thanks to secretary engineer swapnil joshi our president vinay gupta ji and director general uh, dutte sir <coughs> sorry so with this note uh, let me thanks to all the people who joined and really this is the future of uh, bridge engineering thank you jai hind thank you thank, thank you very much for the opportunity thank you, thank you very much thank you just thanks thanks thank you goodbye thank you everybody thank you bye bye thank you bye bye thank you everyone thank you Thank you everyone. Thank you very much folks. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you Rohit. Thank you Ralph. We are the last two guys standing over here. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Yeah. Bye bye.